This is KGW News at 11. They're, they're doubling the amount of work for people without doubling the amount of health. A call for more support for local pharmacies as COVID vaccinations ramp up. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Brittany Folkers. An Oregon State professor says more help is needed for those pharmacies that will soon administer vaccines. Galen Etlin follows up on what that could look like. Starting this week, the federal government will send a million COVID vaccine doses a week to 6,500 pharmacies nationwide. Kind of astronomical. Ann Walls helps manage Preferred Rx Pharmacy in Vancouver. That's one of the independent pharmacies under the Health Mart franchise, set to receive COVID vaccines in Oregon and Washington. So what's the process that you're going through now? We are on a list and we have been getting updates from the state. But she has not been given a timeline yet. That's a kind of frustrating part for us and for our patients, you know, when are we going to get it? When are we going to get it? Brooklyn Pharmacy in Southeast Portland has questions too, waiting to learn how many doses it will get, how people can get connected, and when. We still have a lot of questions that we have to answer for ourselves, but we do feel the ball is rolling in the positive direction. Locally, Albertsons, Safeway, and Costco will also vaccinate people. Safeway and Albertsons offer appointments online, although they're hard to get right now. People have to be eligible based off their state's priority guidelines. The world doesn't stop turning, as they say, right? Oregon State Professor Joseph Agor specializes in streamlining health care services. What sort of supports would be helpful to, say, a small pharmacy that's on this list to start receiving COVID-19 vaccines soon? Additional manpower is always helpful. Like, I can't administer a vaccine, right? but I will certainly help in documenting data. He's pushing for volunteers or supplemental staff to help with administrative work, like tracking vaccine side effects or scheduling second doses. This would help pharmacists tend to regular patients and those getting vaccinated. Most quicker. Eventually, the CDC hopes to reach 40,000 pharmacies nationwide. The National Association of Chain Drug Stores says there's a pharmacist within five miles of 91 percent of American people. President Steven Anderson says that access is key. The pharmacist is the most trusted profession in the country in terms of health care delivery. Ann Walls in Vancouver has been a pharmacist since 1996. And actually was the, like, the first pharmacist to get licensed to vaccinate in the country. And is now part of history again. Kind of exciting to have gone through the whole process and see where we are today with how much impact pharmacists and pharmacy technicians are having on vaccinating the public. Galen Etlin, KGW News. Galen, thank you. Such an important part of this vaccine rollout. Well, hey, football fans, of course, are excited for tomorrow's Super Bowl, but health officials are urging everyone to avoid game day gatherings, to avoid a super spreader event. Data shows COVID cases spike after major holidays and events. Small businesses worry if people get together, it's going to result in tighter restrictions, forcing them to scale back operations or shut down altogether. The warning comes as vaccination efforts gain momentum around the country. So-called super vaccination sites are being set up. The NFL is offering up to 32 stadiums for vaccination events. The military is deploying more than 1,100 active duty troops to help. And a third vaccine could be available soon. Johnson & Johnson is requesting emergency FDA authorization for its vaccine, 72% effective in U.S. trials. While the Pfizer and Moderna Moderna vaccines are 95% effective. The Johnson & Johnson version is a single shot and does not require deep cold storage. It's also 85% effective against COVID's worst symptoms. Health experts say that all three vaccines offer significant protection. Portland police are looking for a hit and run driver who they say killed a pedestrian in southeast Portland. This crash happened near southeast Stark and 136 just before seven tonight. Police say they do not have a description of the car involved, but if you have any information, please call Portland police. We're learning more about the man shot by Clark County Sheriff's deputies Thursday night. He's been identified as 30 year old Genoa Donald. He's still in the hospital. His family telling the Vancouver NAACP that he is on life support. They say they're preparing for his funeral, sharing this GoFundMe page set up to help the family with expenses. The Clark County Sheriff's Office says Donald was pulled over near the intersection of Northeast 68th and 2nd Avenue in 
Hazeldale on Thursday night. They say during that stop, one of four deputies at the scene shot Donald, but they aren't revealing any details about what led up to the shooting. All four deputies involved are on leave while the investigation continues. You know, we have seen a spike in gun violence incidents in Portland over the last year with nearly 900 shootings reported in 2020. And many of those incidents involved black youth as victims, friends and family members. Now, a local program is getting more funding in Multnomah County to try and help those youth before they become part of the juvenile justice system. Christelle Kumwe tells us about the Community Healing Initiative. There have been more than 100 shootings since the start of the year. Six people have been killed and more than two dozen people injured. The gun violence that we've experienced over the past year or so has been devastating. Jill McFerrin II the is the president and CEO of the Portland Opportunities Industrialization Center in Rosemary Anderson High School. The nonprofit is dedicated to helping BIPOC youth and young adults succeed through education and work training. For him, building relationships is key to combating violence. It's all about relationships, and through building those relationships, the community feels comfortable sharing what their needs are and what their concerns are, and then we can activate. Ten years ago, the nonprofit teamed up with Latino Network and Multnomah County to launch the Community Healing Initiative. The program is designed to reduce disparities by Black and Latino um, and other communities of color in the juvenile justice system. How Erica we, Pruitt um, is with the county's Department of Community Justice. But we really want to focus on um, the upstream um, and prevention and do whatever we can to help youth and families before they enter the juvenile justice system. The initiative wraps around families affected by violence or on the cusp of being affected by violence. Really providing our community with resources from educational sports to payment of rent uh, to connections to services through health and human services. Pruitt so says giving that support to families allows them to support their kids and can prevent them from entering the criminal safe. justice system. I think that we um, come through this only in collaboration and in unity and supporting each other as we face what is uh, the virus of violence. But they say and community that, support um, is vital to the process. And we're going to take this challenge head on. And two years from now, we're going to look back and say, you know, we really made a difference. Christelle Kumway, KGW News.